Good afternoon. The silence means that we have to start, so we will start. So today with us we have an Irishman from Paris, and as our ad board says, uh, very the most charismatic, uh, uh, simply brilliant, and representing uh, representing the most influential think tank in Europe. So it's a very provocative introduction. And to say a couple of words more about our speaker um, is to mention that he has a MA from the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. He has his BA from the Trinity College in Dublin. And uh, during his career, he was working as a, as a senior research fellow for the security and defense policy at the Center for European Reform in London, another most influential think tank in Europe and also as a research associate at the Institute for National Strategic Studies, National, National Defense University in Washington, D.C. And currently, as I already mentioned, he works at the most influential think tank in European Union as a research fellow, and he's interested, his uh, research interest includes uh, uh, ESDP, counterterrorism, and defense industry issues. Although our ad board said that today's lecture will be about Irish defense policy, uh, which was called the topic, uh, the Irish perspective on EU security and defense policy, neither NATO neutral nor non-allied. But uh, Daniel also promised to tell us more about ESDP strategic vision and then uh, this, the future of the ESDP development. So, and this uh, lecture will be rather short, around uh, half an hour or so, and I would very much encourage to ask as many questions as you can, because the answers will be I'm sure very, very of a great value to you. So, Daniel, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be back in Vilnius. It's an honor for me to be here with you. Uh, don't believe a word of what you read downstairs on the television about charisma or anything like that. That's simply not true. Uh, I also it's slightly unfair to say that I work for the EU's most influential think tank because I work for the EU's only think tank. Uh, so it's not completely true, uh, at least on foreign policy issues. Uh, but I do want to thank the Institute for inviting me here today and I also want to thank the Embassy of Ireland for supporting my trip to Vilnius. Uh, and I'm going to divide my presentation into two parts, essentially because I was asked to say a few words about the Irish perspective, well, at least my perspective, on CSDP and why the EU's defence policy matters for a small country like Ireland. And in, of course, as we all know, there are a lot of similarities in some respects in the history of both Ireland and Lithuania and in our approach to international security. So why is it that Ireland cares so much about the EU defence policy rather than NATO? for example, which I know in this town there's a lot of interest in NATO and maybe less interest in EU defence policy. So that's one big difference. The second part of the presentation, I'll broaden it out to talk about the future of EU defence policy because, of course, as we all know, the world is changing and how the strategic environment globally evolves will have a big, big impact on NATO, on Lithuania, on Ireland, and of course on the EU's defence policy. And I do encourage you to feel free to ask me questions on any aspect you like. So okay, just to start off, the great Italian writer Dante Alighieri once said that the hottest place in hell is for those who are neutral. Now I sincerely hope he's wrong, because I of course come from a neutral country. Uh, at least that's our official policy. The Irish policy is that Ireland is a militarily neutral country. But the history of this concept of neutrality in Ireland is a bit more interesting than it first may seem, because since the foundation of the Irish state, 
in the early 1920s. The main aim for the, for the main desire for Ireland in international security policy has been to support the rule of law. And that's why, for example, Ireland was a very active member in the League of Nations, which you all remember, I'm sure, from your history classes in the 1920s and 1930s. Now, neutrality as an idea really became crystallized uh, after World War II, during and after World War II. Ireland didn't participate in World War II uh, and indeed was very heavily criticized by the then British Prime Minister Winston Churchill for not having joined in Allied efforts to fight the Nazis. Uh, in response, the then Taoiseach Prime Minister Eamon de Valera made a famous speech in Irish history saying that it's interesting that Mr. Churchill wasn't very interested in the democratic rights of other countries when Ireland was fighting for its independence and that Churchill now couldn't decide what Irish sovereignty should be or would be. So the whole point was that neutrality in the Second World War, it was not a moral question uh, for the government. It was simply a question of displaying and showing our independence and our sovereignty because we'd only gained our independence less than 20 years before uh, rather similar to Lithuania today. We'd only regained our independence, our sovereignty. Uh, and so the whole point was that neutrality was an expression of that independence, of that sovereignty. Now, it's not to say there were no discussions in Ireland after the Second World War about should we change our policy of neutrality? Should we consider joining military alliances? Because a new government came in and the then Foreign Minister Sean McBride did in fact have discussions with the United States for having a bilateral defense pact between the United States and Ireland. And to McBride's surprise, the United States said no. Now why did he say no? Well, the answer is obvious, because the North Atlantic Treaty Organization had just been created. And if a Western European country wanted to be part, wanted the American security guarantee, it should join NATO in the American mind, which is a perfectly reasonable position. The difficulty was in Ireland that it wasn't easy for an Irish government to join NATO simply because that would mean joining a military alliance with a country that was occupying part of our territory, as was the case under our constitution, because we had a constitutional claim to Northern Ireland at the time, which was later removed in the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. Uh, but you can see the dilemma. It wasn't that our, the Irish governments hadn't considered joining military alliances with other countries, or indeed even other organizations, uh, but quite simply because of the political circumstances and constitutional circumstances, we couldn't at that time. However, I mentioned that the primary aim for the Irish in international security has been to uphold international law. And of course, we had been active in the League of Nations, and the Irish also wanted to be active in the United Nations. Interestingly, we weren't allowed, both the Soviet Union and China vetoed our uh, membership, our accession to the United Nations for a number of years because they saw us as effectively part of the NATO bloc, even though we couldn't join NATO. But we did join in 1955. And very quickly, we started participating in UN peacekeeping because, of course, if you're serious, about upholding international law, especially as a small country. Why does it matter? Because you want to ensure that bigger countries, especially bigger neighbors, behave themselves. And you want them to sign up to law. That means you have to be willing to support it and send soldiers, for example, on peacekeeping. And Ireland participated in its first peacekeeping operation in 1958. And 52 years later, we've uh, undertaken, I think it's around 75 overseas operations now with almost 60,000 individual tours of duty, which is a pretty decent figure for a country of our size. And as a percentage of our armed forces, we've one of the highest contributions to UN peacekeeping operations in the world. Uh, so the point being that neutrality, because at that time it was understood to be very much about sovereignty, is not the same thing as inactivity. We have been very active. Ireland has contributed a lot to UN peacekeeping. But that's just a little bit of history. Uh, I'll jump now to the end of the Cold War because, of course, a lot of things have changed uh, in Ireland, uh, indeed in Europe, and, of course, in global security. And one thing that has certainly changed is what do we mean by defence and security today? To put it more simply, 
if you look at the figures of UN deployments around the world, in 1996 it was around 14,000 soldiers. Last year it was close to 100,000 personnel, including civilians, that were serving on UN operations alone. And that's not including uh, all the soldiers who were deployed on the NATO operations, for example, or all the personnel who were, who were deployed on the 12 current ESTP missions, on the 12 current EU uh, peace operations. So there's been a huge growth in international peacekeeping, in international crisis management uh, since the end of the Cold War. Um, now, why in particular, though, does this matter? Why is it that, because of course the EU's development of its security and defense policy is part of this growth in international peacekeeping. The EU created its defense policy in 1999 at the Cologne summit, uh, partly because of Europe's failure, or mainly because of Europe's failure to be able to respond to the Balkan crises. But why would Ireland in particular want to support uh, the EU security and defense policy? Well, I think the first reason might surprise you. Uh, quite simply, it's because the EU defence policy is not a defence policy. It's not a defence policy in the traditional sense of territorial defence. Uh, the EU is not a military alliance. It does not defend its own territory. Uh, there is no clause that has the same type of commitment as Article 5 in the NATO Treaty. Uh, now, there is, of course, a mutual assistance clause in the Lisbon Treaty, and this is very open to interpretation, and I know in some member states that they see this very much as a commitment to have a common defence at the EU level. But if you read the, uh, the clause carefully, you see it says very clearly that for those members of the EU who are also members of NATO, the primary institution and the primary organisation uh, to act for common defence is NATO. And of course, there's also another clause in that same article which covers the specific nature, the specific character of certain member states, meaning the neutrals are non-aligned like Sweden, Finland, Austria, Ireland, Malta, and Cyprus. So the mutual assistance clause, I would argue, in the Lisbon Treaty does not give anything like the commitment that the NATO clause gives. Of course, what makes that more interesting again is, and this is a point I'll come back to later when we discuss the strategic future of CSDP, is Article 5 was mainly designed to counter state-based threats, the Soviet Union. Today's threats are a bit different. Uh, we don't face so much state-based threats as we do many other different types of threats. And if we do face state-based threats, they're not necessarily military challenges. So what is the meaning of common defense? in today's world, uh, but that's a point I'll come back to later. But from an Irish perspective, uh, it's very important to remember that the EU is not a military alliance, so that makes it very different to NATO. Uh, I think the second reason why the Irish governments of the last decade have been very supportive of EU defence policy is its general approach to international security. In a sense, uh, the EU tries to implement what you could call, what some academics and policymakers call the 3D approach. Trying to approach international security in very broad, holistic terms, mixing defence, diplomacy and development. Which obviously, if you can do that, you, you can contribute a lot to international security. What does that remind you of? Well, it sounds remarkably similar to the approach of the United Nations. If you think of how the United Nations tries to mix military resources, peacekeepers, with diplomat, with uh, development money. Uh, that's exactly the same type of approach. So this is an approach Ireland had been used to since 1958, when it first was involved in UN peacekeeping. And the fact that the EU is also trying to adopt this approach, this 3D approach, uh, is of course makes it very attractive from an Irish policymaker's point of view, because we feel you can't resolve most international security problems, indeed if any, with military force alone. You need a mix of different instruments to do these things. Uh, now, I mentioned the United Nations. Of course, it is very important from an Irish perspective that every EU operation has a United Nations mandate. And we have a system called the Triple Lock in Ireland, which is actually the strictest system in the EU for deploying uh, our soldiers on peacekeeping operations. Because not only do we have to have the agreement of the Doyle, which is the lower house of our parliament, and of the government, of course, uh, we also must have a United Nations mandate. And this sometimes can cause problems, because the very first EU military operation 
in, uh, in Fyrom, in Macedonia, actually did not have a UN mandate. And Ireland was the only member state that did not participate in that operation. Now, there are, there's a couple of bizarre reasons why that operation did not have a UN mandate. Uh, but, you know, why did Ireland not participate? Certainly not because it didn't want to help the Macedonian government to quell civil unrest. The problem was that Macedonia had recognized Taiwan, 